Thank you. You may be seated. All right, if you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Ephesians. I want to take this opportunity to uh, say hello to Grandma White. Uh, she's with us this morning, and uh, Dougie did what he promised. He, I saw her carrying her in, and she was kicking and fighting as <laughs> she came. But it's nice to see you out, and uh, nice to have you with us this morning. All right. Men, I want to convey a message to you this morning. If you would honor your wives, as the scripture says here, as we're going to read in a second, you'd be amazed at how she'd take care of 90% of your problems. You know something? I don't ever shut my wife up when she's got something to say. Never. And I'll tell you something else. First thing I do with, with something, when I have to run into a situation and I have to go into a new adventure, something like that for the church, the first thing I do is I say, honey, what do you think? You say, preacher, aren't you being a little weak? <laughs> Men, you dumbbell, what do you think God gave her to me for? The book of Genesis declares that God made me a helpmate. That implies that I need help, right? You say, preacher, isn't that showing a sign of weakness? Praise the Lord! I've been liberated. I came to grips with something, men. My wife knows something, and so does yours. <laughs> it's, it's comical. Then, you know, three years after the marriage, the wife's had a kid, maybe two, and uh, all of a sudden, she puts her fist up in the face of God and she says, I got ripped off. <laughs> I got cheated. Look at this slob you've got me. I couldn't stand to even see him. Um, I couldn't stand company to come up. It was like I didn't want anybody to come up because I was embarrassed of how he acted. And I'm sure I wasn't perfect either. Then the guy sits smugly in his corner and say, boy, did I get ripped off. This woman, she is not like anything I've seen on TV. She is, you know, and that goes through their mind. So the guy starts fantasizing, and the woman hates every minute of it. And the guy thinks that the woman is naive and stupid, and when they have their relationship, uh, at the end of a long, hard day, uh, she walks upstairs or wherever it is their bedroom is, and she's saying, I hope he falls asleep and with a can of beer in his hand and never bothers me. I knew that I was unhappy and that I was also accountable for my life. I began to worry and to search. I started reading the Bible on my own, and finally one day it just all fell in place. The Lord must have really been speaking to me, and just everything made sense. It just like lights turned on for me. All things work together. It doesn't say all things are good, but they work together for good. If I love my wife, I can take a disaster and turn it into something beautiful. That's what the scriptures have done for me. The first members of the church were 12 relatives and family friends. Largely with their own money and labor, they bought land, built a church, and began construction of a Christian school. Within three years, the community grew to over 100 members. All right, if you're related to Ron White. All right, come on up. Carry the White family in general. Submission is funny. It's hard for the unsafe world to understand. The Bible says that a man has got to treat his wife as Christ treated the church. And it's very easy to be submissive and stand behind a man who treats you like God treats his church. It's very difficult to stand behind a man who doesn't understand his place in life. When there's an argument between us, instead of saying, well, I want to do it my way and she wants to do it her way, and we, we don't, we have an uh, impasse, we turn around and we'll say, well, we'll both will do, do it God's way. <laughs> you know? And that's the answer. Ron and Jerry left their hometown in Massachusetts and spent the early years of their marriage in Florida, where they started several small businesses. While in Florida, they were born again. When they returned to Massachusetts, they became early members of the church John founded. Ron's brother Ted is not saved, and Ron and Jerry have been trying for a long time to bring him to the Lord. The last several years have been difficult ones for Ted, and his marriage of 14 years is failing. I worked very hard, 
for so many years. And it was never appreciated. I never cared whether I lived from day to day. It didn't make any difference. If I lived to die, I really didn't have anything. Life was just uh, arguing. It wasn't worth it. And how the heck we lived this long? Together, I don't even know. And we still, we still go on. And I, today, I still don't know. Up to, uh, oh, a month or so ago, uh, she'd be throwing me out every night. <laughs> out of the house. Get out. And of course, she's always would say it was alcohol. And if I wasn't drinking, I'd say, I haven't had anything to drink. So how can you blame me on alcohol now? I would imagine that, that the Holy Spirit had to work mighty hard in, in Ted's life mm. to put him in a state that he's in now. You know, I mean, Ted is really being drawn through a knot hole backwards. There'd be no better satisfaction to me than to see Ted go forward and say, you know, uh, I've accepted the Lord. Now, mm. that would give me a joy like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I'm, I'm joyful just to see the, see the beginnings of it. Yeah, yeah. I was joyful just to see him go to church. <laughs> Not right that yet. seems so far-fetched last year this time. Unreal. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. He, this he, sat, he sat right in, right in our table and told us he'd never go to the church. They can't really make me do anything. The ministers can't make me do anything. The, my brother can't make me do anything. You know, as much as I might want to please him, and as much as what he may say to me makes me feel, well, hell, if I uh, am not saved tonight, I'm going to die tomorrow. I'm not going to do it because he said so. I have to feel my own feelings. I'm me. He's him. All right. Let me ask, anybody have a testimony that they would like to share? Maybe they were witnessing to somebody. Maybe God gave you a million dollars. You know, God should curse me. <laughs> As the old, does anybody have a testimony they'd like to give? Brother Joe? My uh, little brother. I've been speaking to him about the Lord for quite a few months now. And and uh, tonight he accepted Christ. Amen. All right. And we'll just watch his life and see the fruit there. But uh, I'm really pleased because he's the first one in my family, you know, besides me. <laughs> so praise God for that. Amen. It was great. It really was to have a testimony like that. Christ makes the difference. Amen. Uh, Christ makes the difference. He really Amen. does. I saw somebody else with a hand up. I saw it in the corner of my eye. But I just want to thank the Lord for all the works that he's done in my life. And also, I have made a decision that my wife and I, that I am going to wait for my wife. I am no longer going to even think about getting, starting any kind of proceedings against her because I feel that the Lord wants us to be together and he wants us to be a family <coughs> under him and trying to, lead a godly life. If you were expecting more, forget it. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, go ahead, Alex. Go ahead. I pray for my own mother. And she comes home. Amen. Amen. Bob and Emma were together for seven years, and before the breakup of their marriage, they were both members of the church. Two of their three sons are Emmas from previous marriages. Two years ago, Bob came home to find his family gone and for several months he didn't know where they were. After he located them in Florida, 
Emma agreed to let Bob take the boys back to Massachusetts. Today, Bob has the three boys, and Emma lives in a nearby town with Mark, the man with whom she went to Florida. For the last two years, Pastor John has been counseling Bob. John sees the day Emma left as the beginning of a change in Bob's life. I walked into the house. There was no one there. I thought maybe they had gone out. Then all of a sudden, I noticed there was something wrong. Kids' clothes were gone. I looked and her clothes were gone. Kids' trophies were gone. That was it. I was standing in the middle of the earth all by myself. Bob thought he was Mr. Wonderful when he was married to Emma. Dictatorial in the marriage, very uh, abrasive and inconsiderate, insensitive. And when, he, when Emma left him, he was humiliated, totally humbled. It was the best thing that ever happened to him because he's 10 times the man now that he was then. At that time, I never even thought I would make it. The only place that I felt even a small semblance of a human being was at the church. At that time, church was everything to me. It was a refuge for me. Boris is one of the few people who have taken my advice and followed it almost to the T. There are times when I get bitter. And all these negative things seem so easy to come by. You know, it's like picking up a cup of coffee and drinking it. It's very easy. But not to do them, that's what you have to constantly remind yourself of. You know, you have to really work at it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, there aren't many men who bring home the low income salary that he brings home and can cope with three kids at the same time. But he's in church, isn't he? And he loves it, doesn't he? And he loves doing what's right. He's got a sense of security for the future. John tells me, uh, Bob's changed. I know him now. It's John. Maybe you know him, but you haven't lived with him. Oh, yes, I have. I said, you did? He said, well, since you left, he called me on the phone, and I've seen him almost every day. I said, that's not the same. That is not the same. I beg your pardon. Yes, it is. I said, no, John, it's not. It's not. Uh-uh. There were times when I would come home, and I would, on my way home, I would buy her a rose. You know, just for no special occasion. But the thing is, you know, the, it just, it got, to, it got to the point where she felt as though I, I wasn't attentive enough, where I, she felt that I didn't appreciate her enough. And the thing is, you know, sometimes when you're working hard and you buy, yeah, there's, there's one, here's the rose I got her for uh, our anniversary. Not much left of that thing. But it was, you know, it was like, she just, she got so demanding in these things of hers that she started to drive me away from her. I don't see how it could work. I don't even want it to work. I don't even want to try it again. All that time that I live with him, I more or less, Bob wants this done this way, okay, it's all right, we'll do it Bob's way. Why fight? Don't fight, just let it go. Instead of being an Emma, I was Bob's leftover. Not anymore. I started saying, to hell with this. I'm not going to be quiet anymore. I'm going to be myself. And he didn't like that. 
I was accused of having an affair with Mark before I even thought of it. He had to have complete control of me. And when he didn't have that, he fell apart. Why does John have so much faith in him? He's told Bob what to do, and Bob hasn't done it. Why should I believe John? She won't come back unless she sees God working in Bob's life, and Bob is rigid and consistent in that life. Right now, Emma is living in the flesh. Underneath of that facade is a woman who's living in sin, worried about her future. Totally insecure. She did that with Bob. She did that with the guy before that. She did that with the guy before that. When this guy crushes and crumbles, and Bob keeps his testimony, she'll come back. It's just taken longer than I expected. Most people don't understand something. Demonism. The devil is not interested in destroying the marriages of people who are not saved. Those folks destroy their own marriages. The devil's main thrust in this world today is to get a hold of the people in high places with the power that God has endowed to them so that when he gets a hold of them, he can develop a philosophy that is sexually motivated. And I submit to your scrutiny this morning these simple truths. ABC, CBS, and whatever major networks you're looking at today, their main thrust is to destroy the home. Three's company, trash. Trash. Norman Lear is the big producer in a lot of these things. Trash. A man by the name of Tasker writes, and he says this, Christians are to be a moral disinfectant in a world where moral standards are non-existent. Most people think they were born into this world to have fun. But as Christians, we view life as really a serious thing. God placed us here for the purpose of communicating the gospel. Raising children is not easy in a Christian philosophy. The, the world's trying to put their gaff in them. And so the Bible speaks about a spiritual warfare. And the devil is not too thrilled to see families go God's way. And so he's constantly putting temptations out before their eyes. Sometimes I really wish that I wasn't a pastor's daughter, that I didn't have to go to a Christian school, that I could just be, go out for a week and have an unsaved parent, you know, and just try see what it was like, because I've never been in that position, you know, to whereas I can judge. But um, as far as Christian life goes, it's not that all that bad. When we came up from Lynchburg to start a church, although we had our children in Christian school down there, but I couldn't say I'd die before I let my kids go to a public school. In fact, when we came up here, our kids were in public school one year. And I guess both of us were just stunned to realize that the, f the things that we're teaching the children were so contrary to what they were coming home with. So it began to develop slowly. And then I started picking up some of their books and totally shocked. You go where? Why don't you say Valley? What is that? What, I mean, what is that? No, Christian Academy. Academy. What do you mean, Christian Academy? You know Christian the, Academy. You know what the first thing that One people ask me about that school? What? Is it co ed? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is it co ed or are you all going to become it. nuns? Yeah. They figure, you know, we're all going to go off. Next step's convent, monastery for guys. Yeah. We're cool. In a way. Christian things mainly are not fun, you know. Well, I hate to say it, you know. I don't look forward to coming to school every day. It's just not one of my better things that I enjoy doing. You know, not every Christian kid enjoys coming to a Christian school. You have 16, to be a you can date. And then you have to either double date or have, a, or have three chaper chaperones. 
<laughs> and that's just on your All the church. person can now be a member of the opposite sex. Yeah, you know. That's about it. No, no one listens. Well, it's not that we don't listen to him. We just don't, don't listen, listen to him. To him. <laughs> we respect pastor's opinion, you know, but he figures something's going to happen, you know, quote unquote happen. You know, that's in heavy quotes. You know, heavy but he doesn't understand it. Like, when we go out, you know, like a bunch of us from the school, you know, maybe a couple people in the group would be going out. But, you know, it's just like we're friends, you know, it's not any, um, you quote know, unquote, heavy, heavy frosting up the windows, you know. <laughs> what separates spiritual with carnal? Julie, why have you been told that our girls should not wear certain forms of clothing? Because you say they're immodest. Who says they're immodest? You as in the faculty, the staff, teachers. And why do they say it's immodest? Because they can't wear them. <laughs> All right? Jay, tell us about the clothing. Clothing? Yes. What do you want to know? I would like to know what you consider to be spiritual clothing and what you consider to be carnal clothing. What I consider? Mm-hmm. Oh. It's not like you got something on, I suppose, you know. There's a lot of advantages the Christian school has. But then again, everybody's so close, that everybody knows everybody's so good that it's bad. To whereas a public school, nobody knows your home life business. And they don't butt their nose in. Nobody knows about what happens to you. What happens to you is your own business. To whereas here, everybody's like a family. Everybody knows everything. Theodore White, you were a mighty man. You turned around and did a lot of good things in your life. But yet, you continue to go and break my will. You continue to do those things that you knew were against my will. Why? If you reject it, I have nothing to say. I can't turn around and, and say that it was okay, Ted, because you're like you're <laughs> preaching to me rather than telling me well, how you feeling. became born again. Well, that's, all right, I mean, I'll, what, let what, me let me tell, tell you. you. Okay, I'll was say it, how it. How did you know you were born again? You trust God that God's record, His Bible, His book turns around and tells you you can have eternal life by accepting Jesus Christ. I'm trying to find I out what born again is. Myself. See, my life isn't great. I don't feel my life great, see? And I really would like to know how to make my life great. Right. How I can feel. I feel your life is pretty great, see? Let me say something. I feel Let me say something. that you, know, you can know right how now. How far you you've can, come. I'm not perfect, Penny. No, but, but I'm how saved. far you've come. I'm perfect. You've I'm said saved. to me, you know, I said, gee, Ron, you know, how are things going? Great. Why, Ron? The man upstairs. <laughs> Amen. Okay? Huh? And I say to myself, boy, you know, what am I doing wrong? I go to church each week for the last, what, four or five yep. Sundays? Yep. Okay, and at the end of each Mass, the minister says, you know, all those feel they're saved again or uh, would like to be saved. Yep. Come up and... Do you really think that I could go up there. You don't have to do it. All you have to do is ask. I is would have to be a hell of a lot more than I am right now. Your life will change, change. And God when will you do that. You. God, you, you can the do Holy that Spirit right now, and, and in your you life will from, change you. From from this minute forward, will change. Yeah. Guaranteed. How would you, you be can happy know for sure that, that when you die, you will go to heaven huh? if you if you do that. And that's not me How saying that. That's God saying. How about getting a new purpose in life? We'll see. That's it. You know, it's a lot easier if every time you sin, you say. Well, it's only me. I can do what I want to do. I'll pay for it myself. But when you turn around and have accepted Christ and you do it. Well, I can, you know, this is something that means a lot to me. It says here. This but is, I can go to church every day and not understand the things. And, it's not and good now good. I'm going and I feel that I'm gaining something by it. Or I wouldn't have gone. And I wouldn't have gone back again. And gone back it's, again. It's, it's See, good that you have so therefore, when I feel that I know something, or that I feel that I can accept doing or being born again, as you say, mm -hmm. then I would. You do don't it. have to wait until you become a good man 
before don't, you, you don't, accept don't, Jesus don't. Christ. I have to know you, more. You I just really have to know mistake, what, you know, what, I don't know. I figure I'm making a, uh, the, that hurt? the sin is greater for What's me gonna... to do that at this point. I don't know. I, I figure it's a great sin for me to say that if I See, really and truly he's not willing to make the commitment. don't feel it. He's not willing to make that commitment yet. See, That's no. what he's saying. And really feel it. And really know it. At this particular point in your life, Ted, I think that you can turn around and make a commitment to God right now and receive Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Because I think you know enough about it. God has laid enough on your heart now for you to know that if you made that commitment that you would be saved right now. I still feel I have to know more. When somebody comes to me and they give me a problem, I can say, here's what you've done. Do you want to hear what you're going to do? And they go, I don't know. And I'll tell them what they're going to do. If they don't follow the book, here's what's going to happen next. And they'll come back to me three months later and say, how did you know? Friend, I was there. You know, when I was talking to Emma, I was there. First time I met John, since his breakup. Will you meet me at Friendly's? Sure. We got to Friendly's. This surprised me. Didn't even pray before he spoke to me. Set the Bible down. Excuse me, it was the second time. He set the Bible down. And he said, well, Emma, he says, we've come to a decision, and this is the way it's going to have to be. He said, Bob and I have discussed it, and you're not going to be allowed to see the kids down at the church anymore because you are living in sin. Oh, how okay. Next time I saw him, he wants to discuss things with me again. Now I have not. Bob has not run me this time. He's not gotten me to... <laughs> bolt under and do just what he wants. I didn't immediately go out and get another place to live. I didn't immediately crawl to him and say, I want to see the kids. So now, when he finally did tell the, ki my, the kids, I called them. Mom, how come you haven't come see me? I said, ask Dad. He goes, OK, hold on. Dad, how come I, uh, Mom's not coming up to see me? Because she chooses to live in sin instead of seeing your children. That was the answer. I could hear him. Is that, that all that's stopping you, Mom? I said, Dad told me that I can't. He says, Bob got on the phone. He says, don't tell him that. It's your decision. It's not mine. So I'm at fault. No matter how he twists it, I'm at fault. If I allowed, if I, okay, allowed her to see the boys, it would be like saying, well, Emma, you know, you can live the way you want. You can do whatever you want, and you can still, you know, it won't, it doesn't matter. And it does matter. It's no accident that she hasn't gotten a divorce yet. She does know what she's doing is wrong. She's never come up with a stupid humanistic phrase, you know. Well, everybody's doing it. What's wrong with it if we love each other? Why? Because of the way we've handled the situation. Emma, you don't see the kids. Why? Because you're living in sin. Pretty simple. But it's a message. Well, they're being taught that living in sin is bad. Which, okay, it is. I don't have any other choice. What right does John have to tell me that I can't see my kids and... to get in the middle of this. I have to see John again Tuesday. He'll, he will call and keep calling until I see him. And then when I see him, it doesn't get anywhere. I'm just confident that she's going to come back. Whether the Lord's put that confidence in my heart or not, I don't know. But I know this much. God hates divorce. God honors love. Bob doesn't want a divorce, and Bob really does now genuinely love Emma. You know, you got to get saved. You know, come on, get saved. They were urging me, you know, because they were young, too, and they figured that was the right thing to do. You know, you, get, you always try and save people. But they never really explained it to me. I rushed into it, and then about, oh, this is about when I was about six. Then I was about 10 or 11 or something. I started to feel 
you know, I know I had gotten saved, but I kind of needed to rededicate my life, you know. And I, I went through the motions of doing that. And I don't know, I never really felt anything until I, you know, started, I don't know, reading the Bible and stuff. And even sometimes you don't feel, I don't know, touched until something happens to show you, you know, there has been a change, you know. I guess it kind of takes a certain event to show you how much God can really help you and how much you really need him to help you and everything. Some people will say, well, you go out in the world and you're automatically going to do it. Or you're automatically, if you come in contact with um, unsaved people, you're going to turn bad. It depends on how much self-control you have. If you can control yourself to being around unsaved people when they swear that you're not going to go home and go swearing, then I think it's all right to be there. And, you know, you can't just say, for all the Christians, you can't have any fun in life. You can't go shopping because they play rock music in stores. You can't go ice skating because they have rock. You can't go roller skating because they have rock. You know, and that's the way it seems to be. You know, places, you know, you can't do this, you can't, and you get sick of hearing it. You can't, 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 can't. So there's some places where you have to give leeway. It's whether you have self-control or not. God can help you do it, but then again, if you shove God inside, he's not going to help you do anything, you know? If you don't want God there, he's not going to be there. You pay attention, pay attention good, because this is what your kids are getting for garbage in the public schools. They are teaching that, that evolution is scientifically accurate and that the creation story is not scientifically accurate. They're teaching our kids in our public school that if you have the, if you have the stupidity to believe that God created everything in six days when we know the world is billions of years old, and they come across with that kind of lie. Did you know that creation is scientifically more accurate? In fact, it's scientifically accurate, and evolution is not scientifically accurate. And I say that the American public today has a form of scientific righteousness that is ungodly. Because the vast majority of the people in this room, before they stood under the preaching of this preacher, were evolutionists. The Bible teaches the world can be no more than 10,000 years old, and science verifies the very fact that the earth can be no more than 10,000 years old. But we leave our children in those schools with the Philistines, and they are permeated with the interests in the, in the knowledge of scientific self-righteousness. I don't need God. All I need is an amoeba, a primeval slime, a little green ooze, a little electrical charge from the atmosphere that isn't there yet. And all of a sudden you add a billion years to that or two billion years to that or four billion years and you've got a tree. Amen. There's also what we call, what I would call the cardiac righteousness. And that's the genuine kind of righteousness. That's the righteousness of the heart that the Bible talks about in Jeremiah. That's the righteousness where God comes down from heaven and he says, peel away that hard heart. Look down inside of your soul. I've given you a heart of flesh. Use that heart of flesh to move your life. If Jesus Christ is the king of righteousness and the priest, that is to say, the priest and the king of the city of peace, then what makes you and I think that we're ever going to have or ever obtain any kind of peace without the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ? The ability to stand up when it's time to stand up, speak out when it's time to speak out, and do the things that God would have us to do. I really wanted to... I don't have these phones either. No, I know. I'll take it. One of the things that I wanted to, you know, and it's so hard for me to communicate uh, these basic things that I'm thinking in my mind. And one of the things that... Okay. This, thank you. You're very welcome. Excuse me. You. One of the things that I want to uh, ensure you of, one of the things I want to reinforce is that the reason that I'm here, the reason why I keep calling you and wanting to talk to you and wanting to get your marriage, if it's at all possible, with Bob back on, a, on the right tracks, is because I really believe God wants it, not me. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, let me show you something. This will hope this will help you understand. It says, 1 Corinthians <coughs> 5, 7. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And that word creature there is creation, a, cre a created thing. All things will pass away or are being passed away. And behold, all things are becoming as new. Bob has got a big heart. He's got Christ in his heart. And Emma, he's come a long way since the last time uh, you guys were together. Emma, the thing that I want to tell you this morning is you don't have to go down the fifth road. Emma, if you fail three times, what makes you think you're going to succeed the fourth? You're going about it the same way with Mark as you did with Bob. Mark is not saved. Mark does not know Christ as his personal savior. Dear, for the, the chances of him changing, Emma, from what he was with his wife to something you'd like him to become, is not gonna happen. You do yourself a favor, okay? Do yourself a favor. Call Mark's wife. I've talked to Mark's wife. At length? Many times. About him? No, not about him. Don't you think it's time to? No. You mean you want to go into this relationship blind? You don't want to know what you've got? Mm -hmm. You don't want to know what you've got? Mm -hmm. Then, Emma... I know what I've got. All right, you tell me what you've got. I've got a warm human being that cares about me, that takes care of me, that would love to have the kids back with us. Not right. like Bob. Let me ask you a question. Does he drink? Yes. You don't have a warm, loving human being. If he drinks, it's just a matter of time before your whole marriage goes down the tubes. Things are not going to change. You're going to settle down into a normal routine of life, and Mark is going to get just as bored with you as he did with his wife. Emma, don't you understand? If the man drinks, you can't trust him. Well, Bob didn't drink, and he put Chucky's head through the wall a few times. But that's okay. No, I didn't say that was okay. Who, who says that's okay? Did I, did I condone that? No. What I'm trying to tell you is Bob is changing and Bob is different. Well, Bob doesn't grab him by the throat anymore? Emma, not to my knowledge, he doesn't. I know, and I would not ask you to go back with Bob like that. That's not what I'm asking today. What I'm asking you to do today, first of all, is break up with Mark. Because Mark, if he loved you, wouldn't compromise you. He wouldn't dirty your reputation. He'd say, hey, let's do this right. Do you really think what he's doing wrong is going to end up right? Do you really believe that God blesses that kind of a relationship? What else can I do to convince you, Emma? Can't you use your head? Think clear. I'm asking you, break up with Mark so you can start thinking clear again. Number two. You don't have to sit with Bob. You don't have to even come to our church. But get back into a Bible-preaching, fundamental church. Please, for your own good, get back to church and get back into this book. Because this book's the only thing that's going to save you. Don't lie to yourself. You don't love Mark. You see a little bit of security there. You see more security with Mark than you do with Bob. But let's not look at Mark and Bob for our security. Think about it. I am. What if the same things occur with Mark as they have with Bob? Then I go by myself. The hatred is not the kind of hatred you would think of as a violent hatred. It's a hatred, a defense mechanism she's built up because she just wants to get out of that life. Get out of what life? Whatever life she had with you at the time when she left. She just wants to leave a whole mess behind. So it's a, uh, it was just like talking to a cement wall. She, anytime she referred to you, it was with a great deal of hostility, and it was not very often. So, you know, my recommendation is just push on with your life. The thing of it is, Bob, not to get bitter or angry. There's nothing you can do about it. Just go on with your life. John, I'm going to tell you something, okay? I'm angrier now than I ever have been, okay? But right. I'm angry. No, you know why I'm angry? 
You know why I'm angry now? I'm angry now, okay? Not only because of me, okay? But there's three kids downstairs, okay? All right, that need their mother, okay? And nothing's been done about it. Absolutely nothing. Well, Absolutely nothing. There isn't, isn't anything we can do about it. You can only talk and just pray that she does something. Let's just give the Lord an opportunity to, to finish whatever work she started in her heart. John, he hasn't done anything in her heart. You can see that. Well, you can see it. You can see this. it. Let me say this. God had to harden Pharaoh's heart before he could get Pharaoh to let his people go. She hasn't learned her lesson. She isn't going to learn her lesson. Yeah, you know, I, I made it pretty clear that, you know, it's just one stupid move after another. There isn't any more you can do than that. Well, she's left me in the same boat, John. Well, I think... And I, she's up in Fitchburg having a gay old time laughing about it, and she's left me right in the same boat. I got to be alone. I got to raise the kids alone. I got to work like a dog. Okay, to raise the kids, hey, to her it's a piece of cake. She don't care. So take the responsibility that God's given you and take the help that he gives you to do it. Fine, I'm going to do that. All right, so... I'm going to do that. I can understand your frustration. But I'd like to have maybe a little help somewhere along the line. Oh, you know, a little not... physical help somewhere along the line. It's and I got, a, I, got a, I got a wife up in, you know, 30 miles away that's not giving me any help. And you're not going to get any... Well, food. something's got to be done. Something's got to be done about this. All right, you give me suggestions. I don't know, John, but something's got to be done. All right, well, think about it, pray about it. You give me suggestions, and I'll let you know if it's possible or feasible. You know, as far as getting any kind of support from her to help you with the kids. Oh, no, out, no, I, I don't even want nothing from her. At this stage of the game, I'm glad God hasn't brought Emma back to you, because with that kind of a reaction to hatred, God did not conquer the world. You know what I'm saying? And that's I just know. an area you're going to have to work on. Because Christ, Christ mastered the world by when they spit in his face, he blessed them. He says, bless them and curse you. Bless and curse not. He said, rejoice when they persecute you for my name's sake. Now, you're doing what's right. She thinks you're a holy roller and a screwball. She, you're getting the persecution from that area. If you think the devil is going to loosen up his hold without some kind of a fight, you're crazy. We've done what we can do. We've done everything you can do. There's nothing more we can do. So now let's just not get aggravated. Let's not get cutesy pie. Let's not get, you know, don't get angry. It isn't going to do you a bit of good to get angry. John, All it's going to do is cause your blood pressure to go. John, how long? How long? Don't, you don't have to wait any longer, as far as I'm concerned. I don't have to wait any longer for what? To try and work on getting her back. Well, what am I going to do? Just wait till she gets a divorce. If the Bible, the Bible wait. says... Wait. No, she'll get one. She's already, I think she's already got a lawyer. And when I talked to her on the phone, I think uh, she had taken steps to get a lawyer. Just let her go ahead and get the divorce, contest the divorce. Okay, uh, by my hands or somebody else's hands, she's going to pay for this. Well, that's no, John, I have no, John. We, the four of us hadn't, haven't suffered like we've suffered, okay? All right, for nothing. Well, for Bob, nothing, okay? Bob, I don't see as you've been suffering other than emotional strain and drain. Uh, well, that's, you know, I'll tell you something. I'd rather have somebody punch me in the mouth every day than wake up every morning feeling too. the way I do. I agree, I would, too. I would, I would have yeah, to agree I'm sure the kids that. would rather have that, too. You know. All right, I'd rather have somebody beat on me all day than a whip with a whip, because that I can get over. What's up, Chuck? I was just looking for that. Could be down in a minute. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you start talking like an idiot, you know, you, you have to calm yourself down. Because you're not going to lay a hand on her, you're not going to no, do anything. No, I'm not going to hit her. I'm not going to hit her. I'm not even, I don't want to even see her. Well, I don't even want to see her. I wish you could have said that with a little less hate in your face. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Though it may be true, when you say it with hate in your face, it's bad. Now just forget about it. God's going to change her however he sees fit. And if that's the way God wants it, then let's not worry about it. Let's let him do I it. I know that. I'll tell you something, okay? All right, I would stake my life on it that that's no, not the way God wants it. No, I know. Okay, and I will never, ever... Well, put the words down there like this, then, the way God will permit it. Till the day I die, okay? Till the day I die, I, I, till the day I die, I will never allow her to see the kids if she marries him. Never. Well, then, there you don't have that privilege. Yes, I do. I most certainly do. I'll tell you what, I'll take the... When she's supposed to come down, I'll take the kids out. I'll force them to go out. Well... Now you're talking like an idiot again. John, you're I don't want them around. Him. I don't want them around prefer, him, and I don't want them around her when I she's with him. I prefer you to calm down, just get back on track. I, you know, I, I sympathize with you. John, I, I just can't handle this thing anymore, okay? I just cannot handle this thing anymore. 
All right, what's, what's Philippians 4.13 say? I can do all things through Christ. So it's not a question of whether you can or not. Yes, you can. It's a question of whether you will or not. So don't say, I can't handle this anymore. Say, I won't handle it. So at least you're thinking square. Whether you do or you don't, don't say you can't, say you won't. Mm -hmm. But don't fool yourself. You can. Mm -hmm. And uh, believe me, I can sympathize with you. It's hard. It's just, right now, it's just a mental adjustment you're going to have to make. Anyway, I got to get in here. Right, I'll see you later. Get down here and cheer for me, will you? Yeah. face and they know why I'm frustrated. They know why I'm angry. Then I can see it reflect back. At it. It's like a mirror looking at a mirror when I look at them. This cannot, cannot be for good. How can it? How can it? How can it? When I get to heaven, I will look at God and I will say, God, you tell me what good it did. You tell me what good it did. I want to know, because I want to know, because I don't know. I want to know. I think I have a right to know. I think I have a right to know what good it did. I have a right to know what good it did in my life. I have a right to know what good it did in boys' lives. And I have a right to know what it did in her life, what good it did in her life. I have a right to know, and I want to know. I'm telling you this morning that the spiritual life I have, I owe to my wife and the things God's taught me through her. But here is an area where I have a problem. Confession, right? It's good for the soul. Chances are most men have the same problem. We'd rather holler at our wives than to ask them anything. Raise our voices. It seems as though I have more patience with the people in this congregation at times, not always, at times, than I do with my own wife or children. Isn't it true, men, that it seems like you have more patience with your business or with your jobs than you do with your wife or your children? Isn't it true that if your child walks in front of the TV, you'd sooner cut his head off, but if somebody crossed you up in your business, you wouldn't dare do it? You see, we think differently when we're in our business, but we don't understand our real business is our children and our wives and our churches. That's the real business of a man. After the first week that I'd been to church, things started changing. I found there was a change in my house. And the next week, things changed more. I changed more. And it makes you believe more. I had to go back. I drive to work now, thinking about it. I drive to work thinking about God. I drive to work thinking, saying, well, God, you know, am I going to make it today? Am I going to be good today? Am I going to behave today? And it's funny. It's strange to go through every day now trying to please him. Listen and come. As God speaks to you, will you move as we sing? If God would have you to come and he's speaking to you, don't harden your heart. And this week going to church, I could feel 
pins and needles going right through me. And I, and I would look up and I would say, I thought maybe Christ would appear. I saw Ronnie one day and he said, you know, when I was at your house, you know, I could feel God, Christ working in this house. And I don't know if that's true. Maybe that's what I felt in church. Maybe that's what pins and needles are. I don't know. I don't know what it is to feel like that. I, does anybody know what it is to feel God? Does anybody know what? I don't know. But it's a certainly a, certainly there is something. In the year since these scenes were filmed, John Marsha moved to Florida, where John is now enrolled in a doctoral program at a Christian university. Their daughter, Valerie, got married to her high school boyfriend and now has a baby girl. Bob has left the church, and his sons no longer attend the church's Christian academy. The boys still live with him. Emma has filed for divorce and now has visiting rights to see her sons. Not long after he first walked forward to pray, Ted accepted the Lord and was born again. He has been baptized and is a regular and active member of the church. The church itself is growing, and under the leadership of a new pastor, has baptized many new members. <laughs> 